Welcome to the fourth session in researching educational technologies. In this session, we're going to be exploring the concept of trends, part of our examination of futures thinking. And trends is a fundamental element of examining preferred futures. So in this session, we're going to look at the overall concept of futures thinking, and we're going to unpack the processes involved in determining trends in relation to making predictions about the future. Now, futures thinking is a fundamental area of research that looks at where society and humanity may be progressing. Now, it's different to science fiction, but has some similarities. Um, futures thinking is built upon existing data established trends that we can determine and project into the future to make predictions. And we're going to, over the next couple of weeks, look at a range of techniques for developing these predictions about the future in a more research-based way than what might occur with many science fiction writers. Although, to be fair, a lot of them also use futures thinking techniques in order to improve their uh, fictional projections into the future. So in terms of educational technologies, we're very much interested in what new technologies may be emerging and the impact that they will have upon education. But we can also look at the wider societal trends and impacts upon education but also on humanity or in our students, or even on ourselves, as these changes occur. But our main focus will be around technologies and their impact, and in particular around educational technologies. So the first thing we need to be clear about is that in order to engage with futures thinking, you have to accept that there is more than one possible future. Now, it's not to say that there we're talking about parallel worlds and things of that nature. But the fact that we're not heading towards a fixed future. So it's a little bit like when we were looking at um, ontologies and epistemologies, that for futures thinking to be relevant, we need to be able to um, engage with it in a way that we can change the future, that we are empowered to make such changes. And that's a fundamental principle of futures thinking. Otherwise, if we are in a deterministic um, universe where everything is just unfolding uh, along a preordained plan, then we have little influence and ability to interact with that. So within that, not every possible future has an equal chance of occurring. Some will be much more likely to occur than others. And we can start making some um, calculations based upon the likelihood of different things occurring into the future. Now, at, its, at a base level, if we're flipping a coin, generally we've got a 50-50 chance of it landing heads or tails. But if we're looking at what new educational technology might emerge in the next five years, there might be a range of six or seven front runners, which one or two might have a much higher probability than others. And there may be a whole trail of um, lesser probability technologies that may or may not occur, but are much less likely to occur. So all of this fits in with our exploration of the future. But the first step is to start looking at what's been happening in the past. And by looking at existing data that we have on trends, we can then project those trends into the future. So a trend, or a trend used to be that our mobile phones were getting smaller and smaller. That's actually changed. Um, we're now in an oscillating um, trend where the mobile phones are actually getting larger again. But microchips have continued to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, our efficiency of our automobiles has been getting increasingly more and more efficient every year. There are certain things that we can then look at from the past through to the present and then make forecasts into the future. And we'll talk about forecasts in more detail next week, but extending our trend lines 
we can then suggest that if the trend continues as it has been, certain things will occur into the future. So that's what we're talking about when we refer to trends. Now, one aspect of looking at trends is being ambitious in what we try to consider might happen. And this is called moonshot thinking. It's a way of looking at the world whereby we attempt to achieve great things, not just small minor changes, but really fundamental changes that are going to have a big impact upon the world. In education, it might be fundamental things such as um, use of brain interfaces or the use of digital projectors had a major change. The internet had a major change. Lots of things had minor changes, but there were some really fundamental big changes. And moonshot thinking is the idea of trying to um, envisage and implement those sort of changes. But let's watch a little clip that explores moonshot thinking. Oops. First off, um, moonshot thinking came about, um, or the term, from JF Kennedy, or John F. Kennedy's um, speech in Dallas, Texas, about the ambitions of the United States to land a person on the moon. The actual moonshot is wonderful, inspirational, poetic, beautiful, involved, great technical challenges, genuine heroism. It brought the world together. But think about the Polynesian Islander on the dugout canoe deciding one day they were going to go that way. No one had ever been that way before. No one even knew if there was anything that way before. It was amazing. And it changed the world. People can set their minds to magical, seemingly impossible ideas, and then through science and technology, bring them to reality. And that then sets other people on fire, that other things that look impossible might be accomplishable. Galileo is such a hero, you know, in thinking big, and what he represents to me is both curiosity and wonder that humanity had, that he had, that pushed him and drove himself to invent and work on the first telescopes that allowed us to see the moon. These aviation pioneers were, were figuring it out as they went. No one really knew how to build an airplane, right? No one knew how to fly an airplane. It was amazing and crazy and wonderful, and they wanted to explore. Many years ago, the great British explorer George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it. He said because it is there. There's so many challenges in the world, and you can feel daunted by that, you know, and sort of oppressed by that, or you kind of say, how might we think differently about this? Everyone else in the world is working on the next 10%. If you can be the one that delivers that 10 times improvement, you have a chance to really change things. If you want cars to run at 50 miles per gallon, fine, you can retool your car a little bit. But if I tell you it has to run on a gallon of gas for 500 miles, you have to start over. You need a lot of courage in this work and you need a lot of persistence. One of the things that's really critical is not only having the courage to keep trying every day or thinking big, even if you don't really 100% believe it's possible, like you might think this might be possible. Have the courage to try. That's how the greatest things have happened. You don't spend your time being bothered that you can't teleport from here to Japan because there's a part of you that thinks it's impossible. Moonshot thinking is choosing to be bothered by that. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Humanity's progress has been a series of amazing, audacious things from the very small and personal up to the great, big, and grand, and we are a species of moonshots. And to me, that's like the really amazing poetic and inspirational thing. I think our ambitions are a glass ceiling on what we can accomplish. When you find your passion, you're unstoppable. You can make amazing things happen. It's been true through all of history. I believe in the human spirit, and I believe that there are always going to be crazy people who will get out of bed one morning and say, you know what? I think I can build a space elevator. 
Mr. Hills go and do it. But I think that if we become afraid to take these great big risks, we stop inspiring people. We stop achieving things. And the biggest nightmare scenario is that we won't have what it takes to solve the really big challenges. When Kennedy said that we would put a man on the moon, it's about the fact that he said, we don't know how to do this yet, and we're going to do it anyway. And that sense chills up everybody's spine. Because if that happens, what couldn't we do? So moonshot thinking is a way of exploring what might be possible. Now, another technique for doing this is based around a concept called solve for x um, or or 10x thinking now this approach means that when we try to come up with our potential solution to a problem we don't just try to do it at the level that we sort of need we start thinking okay what if we could do it 10 times better or a hundred times better or a thousand times better so if we're thinking about, okay, how could we make this lesson a bit more effective for our students? What if we could make it a thousand times more effective? What would have to go into place in that lesson to make it 1000 times more effective in terms of students learning? That's trying to solve for X. It's trying to take really big ambitious um, goals and seeing if they're possible. Now, every major tech company has a um, a lab where they're looking at these sorts of problems. They're trying to come up with really big ambitious solutions to problems. Uh, Google's got a lab that's looking at life extension, whether or not we can live forever. That's the sort of thing that they're trying to work on. Another one that came out of the lab was the idea of electric cars that could drive um, as far as petrol driven cars were. And they're making that into a reality. So all of these companies do have groups looking at these X problems where we're really trying to do something incredible. But there's less of these in education. And in educational technology research, we can start trying to understand some of the aspects of how we learn, how we learn with technology, but not just at the minor level of where we are now. What if it can really start making fundamental changes what if we can use brain implants and um, EEG devices to map human thought processes? Can we map knowledge directly into the human brain? There's serious talk about that. And again, um, in this case, I think it's, uh, no, it's yeah, Google again has um, got a lab that's working on that with deep uh, brain implants. Well, that one, no, that's sorry, that's Zuckerberg. That's Facebook's working on that one. Um, so these have got some fundamental potential impacts for education. And in educational technology research, we need to be exploring these. Let's look a little bit more at Solve x So it's that 10x thinking or 100x thinking where we're really trying to see a future well beyond what is generally imagined. Now, in order to achieve that, we need to have big problems grand challenges. We can't just um, solve a really tiny problem like how to improve attendance by 5%. It'd be like, how could we make sure that every student desperately wants to come to every lesson? Um, but it also involves a radical solution. So it's going to have to be something new and untried generally. And the advantage we have in technology is that we've got a range of breakthrough technologies emerging all the time. And we can explore whether or not these big challenges, these big problems can be solved by radical solutions using technology. And indeed, educational technologies are often used as a Trojan horse to try out ambitious new ideas in education uh, because people are more willing to accept a really audacious new approach to teaching and learning if it's coupled with a technology. Less likely if it's just presented as a pedagogy um, or an attempt to solve a problem and things of that nature. So let's look again at the concept of X thinking.
Let us define X. X is a solution, a solution to a seemingly insurmountable problem, like climate change or cancer, one that affects the world. But what if we redefine X as a challenge, an opportunity for radical thinking, a chance to light up the world with breakthrough ideas and cutting edge technology, the stuff of science fiction that just might fly after all. Solving for X requires wonder and imagination and a vision to build seemingly impossible solutions to the world's biggest problems. Solve for X. Moonshot thinking. So these are just two theoretical constructs around um, engaging with futures thinking. But in order to delve into futures thinking in more detail, we need some more applied approaches. Now, the first of these is what's called a futures wheel. And we use this to try to explore trends. Remember, trends are a progression of events that have occurred in the past through to the present. And we can then make conjectures that they will continue to occur in that way into the future. But the world isn't made up of just a single trend a single pathway of a single set of events occurring. There's lots of complex interactions between many, many trends. And a futures wheel is an approach to try to um, understand some of those. So the way we go about developing a futures wheel is we look at all the various trends that might be occurring and are relevant to what we're interested in. So the technologies that are involved, the social issues that are involved, the organizational issues, some of the potential hurdles and interactions and any costs involved. And we put all those issues around the outside of a circle. And in the middle of the circle, we describe the challenge that we're trying to look at or the problem we're trying to solve. So in this case, we have the phenomenon to be investigated in the middle. And then around that, we have what are called first order effects. So if we're looking at say in improvements in student retention well let's say um attendance at online tutorials um so what are some first order effects for that it might be things such as the time of day what day the tutorial is on um the length of the tutorial the cohort of students the personality of the instructor um, the content that's being presented there can be a range of first order effects that relate directly to that phenomenon. But then they start to become what are called second order effects. How does the time of day affect the personality of the instructor? Maybe the inst instructor is not that great in Friday afternoons, um, whereas they might be much better um, Monday evenings. There could be a whole range of interactions between these various first order effects as we go into second order effects. And then beyond that, we start then looking at third order effects, how the various second order effects interact with one another. And we start building up a much more complex and interesting understanding of the various trends or events that are occurring. Now, here is one that looks at Bitcoin and blockchain technologies and the various first order effects on of those in terms of being able to um, validate a, an object and have it known to be owned by someone, as we're seeing with various artworks at the moment. Um, you've got various mining techniques of being able to generate bitcoins and so forth. But then they all start having second order effects on the banking system, on the economic systems, potentially on world politics. And all of these things can start expanding out as we explore different potential trend lines, but most importantly, how those trends are interacting with one another. Now, for your assessment task, you're going to be developing a futures wheel, um, identifying a range of trends and building out first order, second order and third order effects along those trends and how they interact with other trends that you've identified. Now, this is just another one looking at um, climate So we'll talk about those future circles more in the tutorials.
But the next concept I want you to have an understanding of are that there are different types of problems. The problem that we set in the center can be quite different to other problems that we set. And there are generally three main categories of problems. There are solvable or tame problems or challenges. And these we know how to solve. We already know how to go about doing them. We're absolutely sure we can do them. We just haven't gotten around to solving them yet. So they're just things that we'll eventually get to, but we haven't actually done it yet. Then we have difficult or crisis problems. Now these are ones that we know how to solve, but we just don't, we haven't had the interest or put the effort into solving them. Um, so for solvable problems, we can often use forecasting to see how we're going to go about doing it. We can look at all the trends, we can say, okay, all these trends are happening. Yeah, we're going to probably get um, better inter internet connections in schools. There's lots of trends in the past showing that we've been having improvements in inter internet connections. So we can pretty much say, yeah, that we'll put a uh, bit more money in over the next few years and we'll have solved the issue around inter internet connectivity when students are at school. Now, a more difficult problem would be internet connectivity when the students are at home. Now, we know how to solve it. We can give them all SIM cards and pay for that and do various other things, but it's it's a little bit difficult. It costs a bit too much or we don't see enough benefit from it and things of that nature. So we haven't solved it, but we know how to solve it. But then we have a set of problems called wicked problems. Now, these are ones that we just don't know how to solve. So one of these is the achievement gap. Some students fail. Some students do quite well and achieve in schooling. We don't really have a full understanding of how to solve that. Why can't we make a schooling system where everyone achieves success? It's a goal that we'd like to have achieved and, and solved, but we're just not sure how to do it. We've tried various approaches, more money, um, better teachers, um, smaller classes, but nothing has really shifted the fact that we still have a significant achievement gap. And there are a range of other wicked problems that exist in education and in the world. We're just not sure how to actually solve them. Um, but it doesn't mean we don't keep trying to solve them and try to find out a way of solving them, but they are difficult for us to solve. So difficult problems, well, well before that we had the um, solvable problems, we can use forecasting to see how to go about developing them. Difficult problems, we use a technique that we're going to explore during the course called scenario building, where we describe a scenario of what the future could be like. And that's used to try to engender support for solving that difficult problem. Climate change is a good example. Um, all the trends didn't convince anyone, um, except for the scientists involved. So then they started developing um, scenarios about what the future would be like if these trends keep keep happening and that's starting to slowly bring people on board with trying to solve um, climate change issues but wicked problems we don't really have an approach the closest thing we've got is a system called what's called backcasting and again we'll be looking at this in future weeks and this is where we look at the future and we say okay we want to get to that future. What are the steps we need to put in place in order to get there? So we look at what the step one back would be and then back further and back further until we get to the present. Um, another approach is to look at, this, look at the future we don't want to get to and backcast from that and say, okay, if we keep doing these things, we're going to definitely get to this bad place. We don't want to go there. So let's not do these things. So there are various approaches we can use to try to solve wicked problems, but they're not as easy as with our uh, simpler problems, our um, tame and crisis problems. So some of the things that define a wicked problem are that they're often multi-causal and interdependent with lots of other factors. 
which complicates our understanding of them. There's no real simple causal uh, effect that we can tackle and change. Um, there can often be unforeseen consequences and trying to come up with a solution can sometimes be almost as bad as the problem itself. There's very often no clear solution. It's very complicated. Um, generally, it's a behavioral type issue and problem. Normally, more mechanistic and um, scientific type problems we can solve um, in a set way by using various experimental methods and other approaches. But behavioral problems are a lot messier and difficult to address. Um, they can often go across different organizational or country or group boundaries. And so you have to get agreement from lots of different people towards trying to solve it. Um, and it often just looks chaotic and un unsurmountable. And so people don't engage with it because they just can't see a way of achieving it. And they're often difficult to define. So there's just a few of the factors around wicked problems. But futures thinking and particularly X thinking and moonshot thinking are ways we can um, attempt to address these really big problems that exist in the world. So making our predictions based on trends are not guesses. We have to make informed predictions about what is likely to happen. So we look at the trends, we look at which ones are more likely to occur than others, and they are the ones that we start considering into the future. And then we look at the interactions between them in our futures wheel and things of that nature. And as I said, it's different to science fiction. But we often start with what's called an environmental scan, which is very much like a literature review. We look at all the issues and information we can find about the problem. What solutions have been tried in the past? Um, how have people investigated the, that issue? What's, what's led to some sort of insight into that problem um, already? And then from that, we start trying to get data related to these things. And once we've got some data, hopefully we can then organize that data to try to have some trends. Now, trends don't always have to be purely numerical trends. Um, there could be trends in attitudes. There could be trends in, in sizes. Those things can be made into numerical data as well. But um, there can be a range of different collections of data that don't necessarily just resolve themselves simply into numerical um, statistics. That said, we do eventually turn most things into numerical data so that we can um, have some measurement and then develop a trend line based upon those measurements. But they can be quite esoteric things. And those, those um, ideas around the use of the data and what the data might mean can be made up. So we could look at, say, um, the trend data in student performance and student attendance and student engagement with technology and make up a new term that relates to those three and look at how that's been changing over the years. Um, using the data from those first three to inform our new term that we've made up and then we can track what that new term represents, which is really a second order effect in our futures wheel. So what I'd like you to do in Microsoft Teams is to post an idea for an X problem related to education. Now, it's not the solution. You're presenting the problem. What's something that we would like to solve? And post that so that we can all have a look at some different ideas around different big challenges relating to education. Remember, an X problem is a significant fundamental change to existing practices. Okay, so we've talked about trends and we take our collection of trends, which may be images and words and graphs and infographics and data visualizations and a whole lot of other things. And we try to make some predictions into the future based upon those trends. Um, the tool we're going to use for your assignment to assist you is a Google um, website uh, called Google Trends. And 
this uh, looks at all the different search terms being conducted around the world and what terms are more commonly searched than others. Now you can narrow it down by country as well, so you can look at what are the terms being searched in Australia and things of that nature. But what it does is it gives us some ability to look at how something has been changing over time. So for example, there may have been significant interest in um, a particular educational technology over time. And we could then look at the search rates for that technology. And if there's been a, a gradual increase in people searching for that technology, then we could make a reasonable prediction that that's probably going to continue into the future. People are going to continue searching and being interested and engaging with that technology say virtual reality. So it is helpful to look at how others have examined the future. And in the next clip, it's going to present a possible future, um, tend to be skewed towards the automobile manufacturer who created the clip, but it provides us a scenario of how various technologies may affect us into the future.
clip that showed a potential future from a particular perspective of an automobile manufacturer, but also a range of new, new technologies that can have a significant impact upon how we live our lives. Now, there are a range of these videos available. Some focus more on education than others, but they give us some insight as a scenario of a possible future. Now, you're going to use um, Google Trends to develop your own predictions and scenario about the future. Now you can think about this in terms of the number of searches that would have been made about coronavirus. Before 2019, probably very few. After then, an awful lot of um, searches made around that particular term. But the number of searches may be now trending off as there's less interest in finding out about the virus. So the same thing will occur with other things happening in our, in our world. And we can also use this to try to track and make some predictions around educational technologies. What is becoming popular? What is becoming less popular? And what are the, what are the other issues that might be being um, significant? Um, screen time, how significant is that? an issue at the moment. Um, air purifiers, how significant is that an issue? So these are things that we could have an exploration of in terms of developing our trends, because Google Trends will give you the past data on the searches as well as the current data. And you can then make some suggested predictions into the future if those trends continue in line with past performance. So beyond that process, we need to think about education. How are various trends going to impact education? And I'd like you to post into um, Microsoft Teams one trend that you've been able to identify around educational technologies so that we can discuss that further in the tutorials. So because educational technologies are emerging all the time, there's always lots of new things to research around educational technologies, which makes it a fantastic area for educational research. Um, but 
beyond just the technologies themselves, there's lots of other things happening in the world. And I've provided you with a document and the website, you can expand this out and download it and expand it even further, um, which maps a whole range of different trends occurring uh, around banking, around health, about education. But what is significant about it is it also shows the intersections between those when they impact one another. And remember, those are where we see our second and third order effects that you want to be able to identify in terms of your futures wheel. So have a look at this document and it may prompt you with some thoughts around how the various trends you're exploring might intersect with other trends in society and in economics and in the workforce or in indeed in education. So that's it for this week and I look forward to seeing you in the tutorials.